Frederick Senna, we have Evan Patterson speaking about principles and pitfalls of software design for applied category theory. Welcome, Evan. Okay, thanks, Brendan. Yeah, so um, my collaborators and I have been working on um, CatLab and the algebraic Julia ecosystem for uh, several years now. And so in this talk, I just wanted to, rather than focusing on any um, particular technical topic, try to give an overview of, of what this whole project is about. Um, just focusing on um, lessons that we've learned along the way. So this isn't going to be a super technical talk, hopefully. Um, it's more uh, intended to give you a flavor of the sort of considerations that are involved when you're designing software to do applied category theory. So first I should mention that uh, a lot of people besides me have contributed to this project. So I have here listed some of the, the, uh, the core contributors to Algebraic Julia. So these are people who have made a sustained contribution to the project. Um, there, there are other people too who have contributed. I'm grateful to all, uh, all the contributions, however small or large. So first of all, like what, what is this project about? Um, so Algebraic Julia is a family of open source software packages for applied category theory. And as the name suggests, they're written in the Julia programming language. And part of the reason for that choice is that the project is focused on um, applications of uh, category theory to science and engineering. So um, the goal is to build tools to help um, practicing scientists and engineers do their jobs better and we're focused on um, modeling. So, um, so how is this ecosystem organized? So we have a couple packages that are general. So, so they're providing general sort of categorical abstraction. So in the first place there's, there's CatLab which has a lot of generic um, machinery for different kinds of uh, things in uh, applied category theory. I'll talk about some of those things. Um, at this level, we also have Simigrams, which is a, a newer project started by Owen Lynch, which is about um, interactive uh, graphical editors. And it's part of an important thread of work on making better user interfaces for these tools. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a number of packages which have been developed for kind of specific domains of mathematics and science and engineering. So, these include uh, algebraic dynamics, which is led by uh, Sophie Lipkind, uh, which is about different kinds of dynamical systems. Um, algebraic Petri, which is, as you might guess, based on, about Petri nets and has some, some utilities in it that are sort of geared towards epidemiology modeling. Um, some newer additions are to package combinatorial spaces, which has an implementation of um, 2D uh, semi-simplicial sets in the discrete exterior calculus and we're using that in a brand new package called uh, Decapods which is about a uh, multi-physics simulation that's based on this discrete exterior calculus and that's led by Andrew Boss. So, um, so the aim of the project um, is to do um, is to bring the mathematical tools that have been developed in this present wave of applied category theory. And I won't attempt to really try to date it, but I'd say it's been going on for at least 10 years now. Uh, it's not the first wave of applied category theory, but some of the recurring uh, sets of ideas that have been popular have been um, monodal categories and string diagrams or wiring diagrams categorical databases, the idea of modeling open systems and their composition via techniques like structured or decorated co-spans, and more. I'm not going to attempt to describe all the lines of work that are going on there. I've mentioned this is sort of a, a biased selection that reflects some of the things that we've actually implemented in the ecosystem. Okay, and so first and foremost, the goal of this project is to take these very promising mathematical ideas which have de been developed in the literature and to make them into uh, useful technologies um, for computing. And so in the first place, we want to build very general kind of, of software um, based on these 
category theoretic abstractions that can be applied in a range of domains. And so that's what a package like CatLab is doing, trying to supply these tools. And then, but we don't just want to build the tools in the abstract because it's, it's really easy to develop a lot of useless stuff if you're not grounded in some applications or motivating examples. And so we work hard to instantiate these abstractions in specific science and scientific and engineering domains. And some of the other packages I mentioned are examples of that. And we try to work with experts in those fields to make sure that we can actually address, um, can help address prob real problems. And also we want to try to build connections between, between fields. That, that to me is part of what category theory is all about. Um, and we want to be able to make those connections manifest in, in software. Okay, and so I want to emphasize that although Algebraic Julia is part of a research project and a research program, it's not focused on the distant future. Uh, it's really about trying to make these techniques uh, useful today. And so as a result of that, like we make all sorts of compromises in the technologies that we work with and the way we design things because, you know, we're not looking at, you know, what might this, um, I mean, we're hoping to, to have, to, to influence and, and, and to learn about what could happen 20 years from now, but we're really focused on building software that works today. So before I go any further, I want to kind of, uh, dwell a bit on the, some different visions of how category theory could interact with programming. And I think it's worth talking about this because I find that when I talk to people who are primarily programmers, they have a certain viewpoint on how category theory can interact with programming, but our viewpoint is a little different. So, so one way we can think about how category theory can impact programming is that it can be a framework for designing programs and especially programming languages. Um, so the idea here is that the concepts in category theory will be used to model the program or the language. And kind of the prototypical example of this is the use of category theoretic ideas in the functional programming community. So in this viewpoint, you have some programming language like say Haskell, and you want to think about the types in the language as being objects and functions as being morphisms and, the, and then forming some kind of category. So people sometimes talk about this category Hask, which is based on the types and functions in Haskell. Um, and whether or not it's really a category is sometimes debated, but that's somehow not really the point. The point is that you're using category theory to model this, this programming language. And then you would hope, so what would be the point of that? Well, one of the goals would be to then have innovative and hopefully useful language features that are based on categorical construction. So again, kind of the most, everyone's favorite example of this is like the use of monads in Haskell to manage state in IO, for example. Um, so that's one viewpoint. Um, another perspective is that category theory uh, provides a framework for um, computing in, a, in certain, in, in other domains. And what it's supplying here are uh, concepts that help you model the subject matter domain, right? So those, con so it could be dynamical systems and ODEs. It could be Petri nets and epidemiological models, and so on and so on. So, so the key distinction here is between modeling the program or the language versus modeling some specific domain or system that's out there in science and engineering. Um, and so this, this second is where, we, is where we live, right? So, so we see category theory as providing um, a toolbox from which one can construct gen very general classes of data structures and algorithms. So an example of this would be that's very popular in ACT is the use of monodal categories and string diagrams to model various kinds of processes. Um, and so in particular, this viewpoint Im doesn't imply anything about the host language in which you're programming. So these two things are not, they're not incompatible, I hope it's clear, but, but they're, in some sense they're kind of, um, they're, they're largely or, or, orthogonal. Um, okay, so, 
So to make this a bit less abstract, to indicate kind of what I'm talking about here, we can look at something, we can look at uh, the way that uh, sets and finite sets manifest in CatLab. So, you know, the category of sets is the ER category. It's the basis for a lot of other constructions, and so it's useful to be able to compute in it. Um, and so here is the kind of the type hierarchy, or part of the type hierarchy for sets in CatLab. Um, so there's like a, there's a, a, a generic type um, called set ob here. And the reason it's not called set is that this type hierarchy actually has no overlap with the base Julia types, abstract set and set for unordered collections like you have in lots of programming language. So already here, this is separate from the, the way that uh, the Julia language sort of by default regards sets. Um, and uh, so I want to emphasize that although it can be useful in some circumstances to regard a Julia type as defining something like a set whose elements are the instances of that type, that's what this, this guy here, typeset, is for. Um, this is not an attempt to model the Julia programming language. This is, a, this is a particular way of setting up computations that involve sets, including finite sets. And in fact, for us, most of the stuff is going on here in, in FinSet, um, because this is the, the basic building block for combinatorial data structures. And um, so um, we, and we especially like to work in uh, the skeleton of FinSet, which is identified with like, you know, the natural numbers. Um, so uh, because that maps really directly onto low level efficient programming constructs like arrays. Okay, and so somehow the point, so one of these is, is it really trivial as a data structure. It's literally just a single integer is all that's there. So this type on its own is quite useless and uninteresting. What makes it interesting are the algorithms that we implement for, to compute say limits and co-limits and finset. And we have invested quite a bit of time in doing that and we can do it pretty efficiently in a range of scenarios um, and, and computing limits in, in FinSet is effectively it's the same as evaluating conjunctive queries. So it's a, it's a substantial but also well-studied kind of computational problem. Yeah? Is it important that we understand the syntax there? Like it's not super important. I, I, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, I'm, I'm current, since we've got a small audience here, so I'm happy to pause and talk about things if you want. So, yeah, so, so these, this, you know, set ob t, where t, so this where is saying that this is like a type variable. So I could fill, say, type set with some, any Julia type. Um, say I could put in like float. And then we would be saying we're thinking of the floats as a set. So this wrapper type is, especially type set is really quite trivial. It doesn't even have any fields at all. It's just a container to put in a Julia type. And the reason for having it is that we can, you know, dispatch on th th this thing. And, um, and so here in FinSet, so this T is always like the element type of the set. And this S here is, is the container type. So when we're looking at a fin set which is modeled by a collection, S might often actually be one of these Julia sets, but it could also be another kind of collection like a list or something if it's convenient. So does that help? A little. Um, I'm not quite sure the distinction makes a time. So, so, just, so you might write, for example, like fin set, set in, set of int, int, and this would be mean that yeah. That's a type, and an element of that yeah. is a finite set of integers. Yeah. So representing okay. a finite set. Of exactly. So yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. But one question mm -hmm. is, you know, Julia itself is, is an imperative language? So it's kind of like, like a lot of uh, contemporary programming languages, it's kind of hybrid. Like, you know, you can write in a functional style if you want, and we often do tend to write in that style because it does a, many like math algorithms are kind of naturally expressed in a functional style, but it but it also it is it can be used as imperative. And so often what you see is that like 
at a high level, things are functional. But then when you dig down into the guts of things, you eventually get down to uh, imperative code, which, which can be uh, fast, right? So like, so to give an example of this, <coughs> computing, uh, let's say, co-limits in FinSet, the high-level interface is functional. It's just kind of what you might expect it to be based on what you can do with co-limits and category theory. Mm -hmm. You can compute them, you can evaluate, you can get the co-projections, you can compute the universal, apply the universal property. Um, but to actually compute, say, like a, a co-equalizer, that boils down to an imperative algorithm which is based on a union fine data structure, which is a classic data structure, you know, for basically for computing equivalence classes. Um, so this is where it's actually really convenient to kind of have a language which isn't too ideological about how computations are done because when you want to, you can kind of work imperatively, but then you can encapsulate that in a in kind of a, a, a safe thing and no one has to know about it and you can use that as a, a like a math style function. Yeah, okay, that's sort of, yep. <clears throat> Okay, so still sort of talking about the, the kind of the perspective of the project here. So, you know, the design space for computational category theory, I think, is really big. And there's a lot to explore. We're exploring some aspects of it. <clears throat> Lots of other people are exploring other aspects of it. And so, one way to try to, one crude way to try to break down like what are the different uh, kind of areas that, that you could imagine working in is, excuse me. Um, you, could, you could imagine, okay, computing in specific categories where you know, the objects and morphisms are given by, you know, you know, data that you provide. So, like, computing in FinSet would be an example of, of this, right? Um, and, um, and the categorical databases features in CatLab, which I'll talk more about, um, are, are grounded in this sort of thing. It's about computing in, like, certain specific kinds of categories. A more numerical example would be the sort of stuff that's in, um, algebraic dynamics computing with dynamical systems. Okay, so we do a lot of this. Um, another sort of area that is, is more related to syntax, and you could think of it as being like computer algebra, which is an understood uh, domain applied to category theory. So here you would more likely be working with categories that are presented in some abstract way, most likely by generators and relations, but maybe by other devices. and you would, be, you would expect the algorithm to have something to do with, with rewriting. Um, and we do, we do uh, some of this. Um, we certainly do a fair amount of stuff related to um, like different kinds of syntax. I'll talk more about syntax later. We're slowly getting into doing more, more rewriting um, stuff, although it hasn't been our main focus. And then, and then a third area would be uh, proofs. So like formally verified um, mathematics about category theory. This is the sort of stuff that you see in proof assistance, and so far we've done none of this at all. Um, and I want—I really want to emphasize that, like, these to me are not; um, these are all inter these are all potentially intersecting things. Even trying to separate what makes computer algebra different than theorem proving is really not so clear once you start thinking about it. It's really more kind of almost a cultural distinction in some ways. And so, um, I think the future for computational category theory involves, you know, trying to build hybrid systems that, that can leverage the best of both worlds, right? That can do um, formal proofs, but also drop down and do computation on concrete things when necessary. Um, but that, that's sort of a research program for the future. But I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or kind of there's this gradual typing and all the other variations. And I, I thought that depended very much on Julia itself. So 
what is it? What? Yeah, I mean, there's like, right, so, so proof assistants would have their own formal language, but, but that language is usually going to be implemented in something else unless they somehow manage to bootstrap their, their project. Um, and so one could imagine some formal system for proving which is embedded in Julia and can interact with and could interact with objects in Julia in, in some way. Um, yeah, but so Julia itself is untyped then? Julia has a type system and it's not, so it's a type system that is designed for a very different purpose than say the use of like dependent types in like a, a modern proof assistant. Um, its types are about controlling dispatch of functions through multiple dispatch. That's basically why they exist to control dispatch. Um, I won't get too much into that. I'll actually I'll talk about types a little more later, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so at the risk of belaboring uh, an obvious point, uh, I do want to point to a certain uh, thing which can cause uh, consternation sometimes. So. I, f I find sometimes when I talk to, to people who are primarily uh, interested in theoretical math that they, they love their mathematics and they want to see it instantiated in code in some way where the, the code is, is like isomorphic to uh, the math somehow, like it really mirrors the structure of the math. And unfortunately, like in, in, in many cases, in most cases, it's not going to be possible to do that in a way where you can still actually compute stuff. And there's, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, the most obvious one is that, well, like a lot of mathematical objects are, are infinite and computers are finitary, so that's part of it. But it, it goes beyond that. And I think more important issues have to do with the, the differences uh, in representation. So for one thing, you know, in math, it's very common to to treat objects that have been identified in some way. So like isomorphic objects in a category or, or equivalent categories, um, you know, we regard them as the same and we, we allow ourselves to pass between different viewpoints on the same object sort of freely. But you can't do that in, in software. I mean, at, at, the, at minimum, the system is gonna have to know about those equivalences and also be able to compute them. Um, so in particular for us, like when, you, when you're doing computational work on like abstract categories, um, it, it's not just the category of, of in, is, that's of interest, like the presentation is also very relevant. Whereas usually in math, presentations are just, they're just devices that you can use to write down like a group or a category, but, but we don't really, you know, you don't really wanna think about the, that, them too much, um, but, we, but we have to think about them. Um, and, and I think most importantly though, like math is just not intrinsically algorithmic. So like, so like data structures and algorithms go beyond the content which is present in most math. And the same mathematical object can have lots of different um, representations as various data structures and it, it may have different performance characteristics or encompass different subclasses of the relevant structure. And at first, this can seem frustrating, but actually, like, once you get into it, it's actually quite fun and in its own right to think about how to implement math on a computer, and it becomes kind of, and it's a creative endeavor in its own right, and sometimes, as part of that process, you may be led to consider interesting theoretical questions that a mathematician wouldn't, wouldn't normally think about. So, to give an example, a simple example of this, um, getting back to the implementation of sets in CATLAB. So usually we, like we would just think of the category set as being like a single thing, right? It's got objects, morphisms, the objects are just sets, morphisms are functions. Um, but uh, as it's implemented in CATLAB, it's, it's a more heterogeneous kind of thing. And it's a bit like, that th resembles kind of this profunctor here where we think of, you know, the from fin set to set, where we think of the 
the heteromorphisms in this thing as being functions that go from a finite set to, to a generic set. And why would you want to do this? Well, it has to do with what's finite and what's not. So like, um, obviously, a function between two finite sets is specified by a finite amount of data. But also, a function from a finite set to an arbitrary set is given by a finite amount of data because you just need to pick a finite set of elements out of the codomain. And so that's why these, these heteromorphisms get highlighted. And then finally, functions between arbitrary sets can't be given explicitly by a list of data, so they have to be specified by rules or algorithms which tell you, you know, how you can compute them when given an input. Right? Lambda, and, lambda terms. Yeah, lambda terms, that's right. They have to be like lambda terms. Whatever. So, so th this manifests directly like in the, the way that we represent different kinds of functions. So let's consider one of these heteromorphisms, which has been specialized a bit more, to go from this finset int, which is the skeleton of finset, to um, a type set, so just viewing a Julia type as a set with elements of type T. So one could represent this in lots of different ways. So an explicit representation would just be to give a vector whose elements have type T. So a one-dimensional, uh, in Julia, a vector is a one-dimensional array. It's not necessarily a vector in the sense of linear algebra. <coughs> so sorry for that. Um, and then you could also say, well, I could specify this by an arbitrary Julia function such that, that at least if you give it numbers between one and n, it will give you uh, an, an object of type T. You could also have something which is like a lazily taken composite of, say, like, like a data structure which represents a composite of a function between finite sets and so a function of type one and one of these functions of type two here. So like there are all of these correspond to different concrete data types which are uh, uh, subtypes of a type which represents you know uh, a function between sets. Right? So this is a simple example of how the different representations um, matter and, there, and these different representations are useful for different kinds of computations. So this viewpoint extends to our in-memory implementation of categorical databases which we call attributed C sets or attributes for, for short. So um, excuse me. So this model is, is uh, based on a paper by Schultz et al. Um, and so net, and, and from this point of view, excuse me, you know, when you, you, it's in this, the entities in your, in your database um, are given by like finite sets of things. So that, that part involves a mapping from your um, schema specifying the entities into FinSet, um, whereas the, the data attributes correspond to Julia types. Uh, so the attribute types correspond to Julia types, and so this, this set of, of attributes gets mapped to, attribute types gets mapped to, to set. Um, so this is not something that like normally comes up when, as a mathematician, you think about like uh, just uh, Cope sheaves as a model of databases. You don't really need to bother to distinguish between attributes well, there, are, there is a conceptual reason too, but by and large, no, you, no one really thinks about this in, in, the, in most math literature, but when you come to implementation, this, this distinction between um, attributes and, and relation, functional relations on the entities becomes relevant. Okay, so, so, even if we set aside this issue of, of data attributes, um, the class of things which can be defined as a, a, a C set or Copri sheaf on C for some category C is just hopelessly big. Um, it, it's, you know, you're not going to be able to have, a, a, you know, first, I mean, 
the, because the category C could be uh, all sorts of complicated things that, that you, you're not going to be able to code up in a finitary way. And so, so I'm going to go through what CATLAB currently supports and then maybe talk about in the future directions we'd like to move into. Um, so all of this being kind of an extended example of the design problem that one encounters when trying to take some mathematical concept and, and give it computational content. So, so today, CATLAB supports um, C sets um, on a category C that could have, well, first of all, that schema C could be truly finite, meaning it actually has uh, finitely many objects and morphisms. And this encompasses quite a few examples. So like the schemas for graphs, including their reflexive and symmetric variants, for whole grain petri nets, for wiring diagrams, they're all actually um, finite, truly finite. Uh, but then you can also have like uh, finitely presented categories, which necessarily have finitely many objects, but in general can have infinitely many uh, morphisms. So the classic example of this is the free monad on one generator, which is the schema for discrete dynamical systems. And in the free case, it's easy to tell whether or not the resulting category will be infinite. It's infinite if and only if the generating graph contains a cycle. In the non-free case, all bets are off. Uh, in general, determining whether it's finite is a difficult computational problem. So currently, in CATLAB, both classes are supported by the same mechanism, namely presentation of the category C by generators and relations. And for us, currently, the distinction between Surprisingly, the distinction between finite and finitely presented matters less than you would think for a lot of constructions, um, including, say, computing limits, kind of general limits and co-limits of C sets and things like that. There are some things where it matters. Um, and for the most part, we are just avoiding those situations. But, but yeah. is it still the case that kind of doing things for a smaller finite things is easier than doing things for bigger finite or, or, or finite represented. So you know, at least the, the traditional um, uh, expected behavior is yeah. true. Yeah, so it's definitely true that, like, let's say your category, if your schema C is finite and it just has less stuff in it than another one, all things equal, that will be more efficient. But probably the determining factor of whether things will be fast or slow is less the size of the, the schema and more the size of the data associated with each thing in the, in the schema. Yeah. Um, so one thing I'd like to see in the future is support for C sets on categories C that may not be finitely presented, but nevertheless admit some kind of finitary description where what it means to, to be so described is left to be determined. But uh, the following examples should all kind of kind of fit this pattern. So like, for example, um, if you go from graphs up a dimension, so graphs present uh, free categories. If you go up a dimension, the things that generate free two categories are, some, are these things called two computads, which basically have a generating set of, of uh, objects, morphisms, and two cells. But in order to describe the domain and codomain of the two cells, you have to be able to talk about composites of one cells of, of arbitrary finite length. And so it turns out that two computeds belong to a, a pre-sheaf category, but the, you know, the schema is going to have infinitely many uh, objects that correspond to these uh, links. A similar example would be like opitopes in dimension two, which I think would be a nice data structure for diagrams, even in, in one dimension, that have some, some commuting cells. Um, and a, an example of a different flavor would be, somewhat different flavor would be things like simplicial and semi-simplicial sets that haven't been truncated to, say, a given finite dimension. Um, and so he, this is an example of a, of a problem that, of a design problem in computational category theory. Figure out a nice uh, 
way of describing things like this that will lend itself to um, efficient and useful uh, implementation. By the way, if anyone has thoughts on this, I'd be interested to hear them. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so the first principle I'd like to highlight is that, um, so category theory, part of its whole appeal is that it offers this very general class of abstractions for, for modeling. Um, but um, often abstraction in uh, programming can be a double-edged sword because that abstraction could cause performance overhead. It could make things slower. But the point that I want to make is that with the right uh, techniques, abstraction doesn't have to come with an overhead. So you can get the best of both worlds. And um, the way that we've implemented attributed C sets in CatLab are kind of a, a, a case study in, in this claim. So um, in the first place, it's clear that um, C sets are much more general than graphs. Graphs are a particular case of them. Um, yet nevertheless, um, CatLab's graph li graphs library, which is basically a simple wrapper around the Atchets machinery, is able to achieve performance comparable with state-of-the-art graphs packages in Julia. Um, and this is possible uh, through a careful design that takes advantage of some of Julia's um, language features. So I'm going to talk a bit about this. This was actually the topic of our first journal length paper on algebraic Julia, so you can read more about it here if you're so inclined. Um, but, but in a nutshell, the, the point is this. Um, the key to getting good performance is to separate, is to appropriately separate the different phases in which computation can happen. So there's, there's a static phase, uh, and this is true in basically any kind of, so this is just in general, this is kind of, uh, software engineering you know, knowledge here. So in, in, mo in a, basically any language, there's a separation between the static phase, which is what happens at, during compilation and, the, and, and dynamic, which is what happens during runtime. And so the idea is that if you're gonna have a computation that's gonna run many, many times, um, you should pass it through an optimizing compiler so that you get performant machine code for those operations. And so in the case of, of Atchets, things that you would want to have be pr appropriately compiled are things like the low-level accessors and mutators that, that you know, add elements to, to the sets involved in, or, or inspect them. And in addition, you want to be able to, you want to have the various updating of the indices that make reverse lookups possible, such as like finding, you know, which edges are incident to a vertex, that should also be properly compiled. Whereas one-off computations, things that you're only going to do once, you actually may not want to pass them through the compiler, especially not with a lot of optimization because that, has, oh, that takes time. And so you could actually end up in a perverse situation where you spend more time, you spend all your time actually compiling your program, not running it. Um, and so the distinction between static and dynamic manifests differently in different languages, right? So in a traditional compiled language like C or C++, there's a strict separation between the phases. There's compile time and then there's runtime. That's it. Um, in an interpreted language like Python, technically there, there usually is something that resembles compilation, but it's very, that, that phase is very minimal. And as a result, there's little opportunity for optimization to happen during compilation. A language like Julia, which is just in time compiled as a kind of hybrid, the static and dynamic phases are interwoven and compilation happens on the fly, you know, as it's needed. So rather than everything being compiled at the get-go, when a function is called with new types that haven't been used yet, it's, it's compiled for those types on the fly. And so, so that is actually a powerful combination which we exploit in the design of Agits and CatLab. So, um, so specifically, we implement the, the low-level Agits API using something called generic functions, which is a form of metaprogramming that, that Julia has. And so, so what is a, gener a, a generated function? So an ordinary Julia function is what you would expect. It's a thing that 
takes some data of specified type and is supposed to spit out some other data of specified type. A generated function is something that, that takes the input types of the data and then allows you to produce a Julia expression, Julia code, based on those types that may depend explicitly on those types and that will be compiled the first time you evaluate the function with data of that type. And so we use this, um, and so that's what we use in the implementation of adjets. Now, in order to, to do this, then we're gonna, we, we're gonna need to pack the, the whole schema for the, the presentation of, of the, the schema has to be packed into the Julia type. But in, in, in fact, so that starts to look something almost a bit like dependent types in, in as much as we're putting of what would be considered a value into the type. Now, Julia is not exactly a dependently typed language. It doesn't allow arbitrary dependence of types on values, and it also doesn't have some of the other things that one typically associates with dependently typed languages. Nevertheless, it does allow you to put enough kinds of values into a, into a type to suffice for this purpose. Um, and we exploit that. Um, I just want to remark that I actually think that peop people think that often type, you know, dependent types are viewed as being a, a hindrance to being efficient. But I think there's a, a frontier in programming language design about really thinking about how to use dependent types as a way to control the static versus dynamic phase boundary and, and as a result uh, actually get better performance. And, and I don't think that the Julia language is like it's by any means the last word in this. I think it's an interesting direction to explore in programming language design. Okay. So another principle that we've come to, that, that we uh, have explored in the course of developing CatLab and algebraic Julia is the distinction between uh, syntax and syn semantics. Now, certainly this distinction is fundamental to mathematical logic and computer science. Um, and so, and, 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 but um, I think that category theory and categorical logic add and enrich this, this distinction in some ways, and, and that informs the design of, of CatLab. So, so in, in the sense of syntax, it suggests, so usually syntax is just, for, for computer science, usually ends up checking out to something like expression trees. But um, category theory suggests a much more expansive view of what syntax is that regards syntax as being itself a part of, of algebra. So like a great, so like an example of this would be the use of operads as, a, as an algebraic gadget for describing the syntax of composing things in a modular hierarchical way. Um, and um, in the, in, as far as semantics goes, um, functorial semantics allows you to think of, it makes it easy to think about theories being interpreted in categories other than, than set. So to get, so to, so to reprise an earlier point about the distinction between modeling, you know, the language and modeling the domain, when I'm talking about syntax here, I'm not talking about the syntax of the Julia programming language, which is what it is. It's kind of a historical accident that it is what it is because it's made to superficially resemble MATLAB. But rather, I'm talking about the syntax for the domain that we're modeling using category theory. Um, so to bring this out, finally a little code. So in the first cell, we have the Julia syntax associated with a macro, we kind of have this domain specific language for defining UWDs that's grounded ultimately in Julia syntax because it's a macro. Um, the thing, so that's how you would input, that's a simple way to create an undirected wiring diagram. Um, but as a, but the actual syntactic object that we're going to compute with is the UWD that this produces. So this is a visualization, this is a visualization of it. Um, and as, uh, and then what it really is combinatorially 
is an atchet on a particular schema. I'm not going to really get into this too much. My point is that, that we're treating this syntactic thing is, is, is ultimately it's a combinatorial data structure. So why is it useful to have uh, this distinction and to make syntax part of your whole computing uh, paradigm? Well, undirected wiring diagrams are a syntax for a whole lot of different things. So there are syntax for composing spans or data tables. This is one viewpoint on conjunctive queries. Um, Relate close, closely related to that, they're a syntax for pixel arrays or composing pixel arrays, aka Boolean tensor networks. Um, they're good for uh, specifying the composition of structured cospans, which are, which include things like open graphs, uh, open Petri nets, um, and open uh, free diagrams in a given category. And they're also good for composing. Uh, things like ODE systems uh, in, via so-called resource sharing. Um, and in fact, all of these modes of composition are implemented somewhere in algebraic Julia, um, although some of them have been given more attention than others um, in, terms of, in terms of their efficiency. So CatLab actually has two different viewpoints on syntax that it provides. So one of them is generalized algebraic theories, or GATS. So uh, you can think of GATS as being, uh, in a slogan form, GATS are algebraic theories with dependent types added on. So th this is basically like a minimal extension of classical multi-sorted algebraic theories that is suffices to like write down the theory of categories. Um, so this is kind of the version of algebraic theories that's good for working with categorical structures. And these are closely related to other things you may have heard of, like essentially algebraic limit, essentially algebraic theories and finite limit theories. I won't be too precise about that. And the main relevant thing is that um, um, the theories are described in a bias style in the resulting expressions that one gets for for things in the theory are in a biased style, meaning that they're based on, say, primitive operations of like fixed arity. So like the composition operation in a category is a binary operation. Okay, the other approach is uh, the one that we just saw an example of with UWDs. It's combinatorial in nature. We call, sometimes we say these are combinatorial operads. That's not really a standard term, which is why I put it in scare quotes, um, but, but it's grounded in an unbiased view of syntax that is uh, cashed out using the concepts of operads and operad algebras. So, and they're combinatorial in the sense that in the ones we work with, the morphisms in the operad are combinatorial data structures, uh, which for us means that they're, they're atchets. Um, so some of the important examples that we have implemented are um, directed wiring diagrams, which are a combinatorial variant of string diagrams, UWDs, which we've seen, and, and another thing called circular port graphs, which I won't talk about. But anyway, so, so to give you, so going back to GATS, just to give you a flavor of what uh, they look like, so CATLAB has a, uh, a macro for specifying a, a GAT, um, and so here's the theory of categories. There's a type constructor for objects and for morphisms. The morphism type constructor involves dependency. This is where the dependent types business is coming in because it depends on two objects, which are the domain and the codomain. Um, there are term constructors, so identity and composition. And finally, you can have equational axiom. So this is a coding, the, of course, the associativity and unitality axioms. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, this is just kind of to give a little flavor of what that looks like. Um, but the essential algebraic bit there is happening on, you know, it's happening by syntax, right? Because you'll have the B being the same, A to B, and B to C. Exactly. So, so yeah, as, so there, that's right. So if you thought about this as like an essentially algebraic theory rather than a GAT, you would say that like, 
composition yeah. is a morphism on like hom times hom, but then you would have like a side equation which says that like the codomain of the first one is equal to the domain of the first one, whereas in the gap viewpoint, you sort of input, you encode that not with a set of side equations, but by reuse of these like variables in the context. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have, maybe you'll get to this. Yeah. Thing, but can you say something about like there's some sort of macro yeah. that you defined in, in Kendall? Yeah. Like what sort of thing does this expand to? Like does this define uh, a type? Yeah, like so, so basically what this expands to is like uh, a, a data structure that encodes this stuff in kind of the way you would expect, like a, like a like expression trees of, for the GATs, as well as storing like the context that, so, that go along. So this tells me that this, this gives me a data structure called like category. Yeah. And to give a category, I have to give as, like an object, a, a type of objects. Yeah, well, I'll come to that in one, in one sec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, okay, so, and, and, and GATs have some advantages. So I'll jump down to the third point here, since this is Eigel's question, I think. It's, it's easy to then define like semantics, uh, in other words, to define a, a model of the theory in terms of Julia types, because all you need to do is implement a certain set of, you know, operations with like fixed arity. So like to give an instance, the theory of categories, you need to give a, two Julia types, one that represents the objects and one that represents the morphisms, you need to, and then you need to implement um, identity and compose. And because this is not formally verified computing, it's on you to make sure that it's associative in unital. So but do the equations have any kind of semantic meaning or is this just a comment, essentially? For the most part, it's, it's just a comment, at least as far as the instance macro is concerned. Um, we're, we've done a little bit of like explorations around like uh, rewriting in GATS, in which case you would use the equations ideally to, to I was thinking if it would make sense to like generate tests yeah, that's a, that's a something that we um, absolutely uh, should do, but aren't currently doing okay, that. Sure. But, but yeah, something like that, you could, you could definitely imagine using them for that purpose. It's a great point. Okay, so some other advantages of GATS um, is that uh, they're pretty easy to, to, like, to write down. Like, like if you look at a definition of kind of category theory concepts in your favorite textbook, it's usually not too hard to translate it into a GATS. It's kind of a pretty mechanical process once you get used to it. Um, but, but GATs have some ma major disadvantages um, when you get to um, the kind of higher dimensional categorical structures which are so prominent in applied category theory. So like first and foremost are like, just like symmetric monodal categories themselves and variants of that, like hypergraph categories um, and other kinds of SMCs with extra structure. And then nowadays people are even using double categories and symmetric monodal double categories and, and, and boosting the dimension still higher. Um, and this is a problem for GATS in practice because it forces you to make arbitrary choices in the way you decompose, say like a morphism or a two cell or whatever, into these primitive operations that are available to you. So like the classic example of this, that the motivating example is the interchange law for morphisms in a symmetric monoid category, right? So like we can exchange, we can interchange, you know, which of uh, compose and tensor appear on the inside or outside in an appropriately typed expression. And because of the evident symmetry of this law, there's, there's, usually, there's like no intrinsic reason to prefer one to the other. And, but nevertheless, if you're working um, with morphism expressions, you're gonna be forced to make choices like that. And so there are some different ways you can obtain those expressions. One is like, well, there's human labor, well, there's, so there's human labor and there's computer labor. So on the one hand, you could ask the user to write down the expression for you, and that's time consuming and error prone, and, and it's especially annoying to deal with um, permutations, so like identities and swaps and the way you have to compose them to actually get the thing you want. 
You can also ask the computer to say, like, if you, if you had a directed wiring diagram, to say, give a morphism expression that would correspond to it. And we actually have something in CATLAB that does this. Um, but there are some caveats there. I mean, it's fairly complicated. I won't get into it much. It's sort of an a issue of, like, it's kind of like buyer beware sort of stage of technology. But also, like, it just doesn't scale that well with, like, there are all sorts of different flavors of SMCs. And especially for things like hypergraph categories where there are even more sort of arbitrary choices involved, um, we don't support all of that stuff. So, so the nice thing about the combinatorial opera viewpoint is that it really it bypasses this problem entirely because you, instead of working with hypergraph morphisms in a hypergraph category, you say you would work with UWDs. And um, I would say this approach is especially embraced in, in Sophie's package, Algebraic Dynamics. Uh, the whole thing is sort of designed around certain kinds of combinatorial operats and then giving semantics to them in um, different, uh, for different kinds of dynamical systems. But there's a caveat to this too, which is that unlike writing down GATs, designing these combinatorial operads is not really a mechanical process, right? Uh, it doesn't, no, no one has found a, no one has found, as far as I know, a uh, mechanical way to take a theory presented in a traditional bias style and give a fully unbiased description of what goes on in it. Um, and so related to that, an open problem for us, we've thought about some, but not satisfactorily resolved, is deciding, figuring out what is a, what is a combinatorial operad really? And, and are there more systematic principles by which we can design them and implement them that would reduce the implementation burden uh, involved in dealing with new kinds of operads? Okay, so that was uh, kind of just a, hopefully not too rambling overview of some of the different kinds of things we've, we think about when designing um, software. Um, I'll conclude by just mentioning that uh, some resources for, uh, that you could look at if you want to read more. So in particular, like our blog has quite a bit of content um, and is a decent pedag pedagogical resource. And uh, this wouldn't be a talk on open source software if I didn't include, conclude by saying that uh, we're always looking for new contributors. Um, so uh, if you're at all interested, uh, please reach out and we welcome contributions at all levels. So thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, so like I guess if you wanted to do like, uh, yeah, like ODEs by resource sharing, like you could define uh, the primitive operations. Like you, you, you would, instead of, you, you would have some kind of co-span thing, then you would define composition and identities and permutations and cup and cap. Uh -huh. And in a sense, it can be easier than writing like an operate algebra because rather than having to kind of do everything at once, yeah. you can just focus on simple primitive things. And so that's part of the appeal of it in a sense. But then, yeah, you've got this issue of like, okay, well, having implemented th those primitives, you have exactly the issue I talked about of like, well, now how do I do something useful mm -hmm. with that? How do I get an exp Like once you have an expression, you can, you know, go from syntax to semantics by sort of just recursively applying the operations that you implement. Mm -hmm. But you've got to get the expression somewhere, and that's the, can be annoying. Oh, can I ask a second question? Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of at the beginning, we talked about, like, Catalan, we think of as, like, being a applied to don't category theory first, don't make, but yeah. rather than category theory for the programming itself. Yeah. 
Uh, do you have an example of like the most applied gas thingy, like the? Um, so one GAT that we worked on a fair amount at one point was related to like uh, graphical linear algebra, especially like the functional variant. And so, so like, um, and we provided instances for it. So, that, so Julia has its roots in, in numerical computing, right? So there, there's a ton of linear algebra stuff, both in Julia itself and in, and in the the broader community. So we provided instances of like this GLA kind of theory in uh, some both built-in and, and some external packages for representing linear operators in, in maps. And it's really easy to do that because like usually the tools that you're interfacing with, like they're, even if they're not, they're not, they may not be written by category theorists, but nonetheless, the structure is still there. So they still have a compose, they still have the things, and it's just a matter of like calling the right functions. So it's like really easy to implement that sort of um, thing. So that's like one example. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. You know, it, it feel, I mean, it might be just me being incompetent, but it feels to me like we're going talking about category theory and, and, and stuff like that. And then at some stage, we start to talking about AC sets all the time. You know, they, they became so much, um, it looks like they are the most important thing ever and that we're going to rewrite everything mm. in terms of them. I, first of all, is that just my impression? Is my impression wrong? Yeah. I mean, or so it's, 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 so why? <laughs> it's right in the sense that that's one of the areas that we've invested the most development time into because we found it to be a useful abstraction that's, that applies in a lot of situations. But there's also this thing that like you use the tools that you have available and even if they may not be the thing best suited to the job. And so I find that like every time we, because category theory is so, uh, you know, it swallows up so many sort of things with its tentacles that, you know, often we find we implement some feature because we want it for one thing and then find that it's useful for all sorts of other things. And so like, I, the way I, I see Atchets is like, actually there's this whole hierarchy kind of, of like categorical logic and, and like C sets sit at like the very bottom in the sense that like their schemas are the least expressive you can have. And so like one direction that I think we'll move in is like having, you know, products in schemas and like a finite product sketches or like finite limit sketches or other kinds of things and and move up the kind of the ladder in terms of what you can put in your schema and that will come with interesting all sorts of interesting design questions about how to make how to how do we compute with that extra stuff and uh, what constructions become easier or harder to do. So, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. You, no, yeah, yeah. Let's thank Adam once again. Huh?